gentleman at the FCC that worked with me and said, well, if you move your transmitter one point, very precise, 1.6 kilometers to the east, which basically put me at the end of uh, 216 where it meets 91 over there in Bradford, then I could keep the station on the air, but then I, I would have to, I could move to 96.7, which by the way is a much better frequency than 96.9. There's no stations to the north or no stations to the south that interfere with it. The closest station uh, to the west is in Westchester, New York. Um, and, and I don't even know where the station, closest station to the north is. I think it's like up in New Hampshire or Maine somewhere. So 96.7 was a great, it was like a blessing in disguise. I didn't realize it at the time. It was one of the best things that ever happened. So I moved the antenna over to Charlie's Mobile, which is at the intersection, and that's where it was for uh, a few years. That's WBLQLP. 88.1, it became KLUG. That station was later sold. So 96.7 was the new home for WBLQ. 2007, moved from the credit union to the Brown Building in downtown Westerly. There were a couple of reasons for that. Number one, the overhead was kind of crazy where I was in Dunn's Corners, the, the, especially the price for heat. Uh, which was gas heat, and uh, the electric bill and the rent was, you know, a little beyond my means. And the other reason I did it was because in the spring of 2007, the chief engineer of 1230 AM, who I knew, his name was Steve Callahan at the time, came down and met with me and said, Chris, uh, I just want to let you know that 1230 is coming up for sale, and I can't think of anybody better to operate that station than you because of what you're doing with local radio on 96.7. And I said, oh, that's great. And I said, you know, what do I have to do? How much? And he said, $350,000. And I said, <laughs> I said, well, how the heck am I gonna do that? <laughs> well, then I thought about it, and, and I knew that somebody would get a hold of that station if it wasn't me. And back then, the economy was good, 2006, 2007. It's not what it ended up becoming. So. I thought to myself, if I don't get a hold of that station, somebody else will, and they're gonna beat me up on 96.7. So I basically talked to some different lenders and financers from throughout the area, and I actually found one online, believe it or not, at the time, we were doing things online at that time, and there was actually a company that lent money to radio stations, and I thought I had everything pretty well secured, so I ended up filing the paperwork. Um, it ended up being a two-year process, though, the FCC got everything approved pretty quickly, believe it or not. The, the FCC is usually the slow one. But the Rhode Island Attorney General was also involved because a few years back, in the early 2000s, they tried to sell 1230 and another station they owned in Providence, 1290. And apparently they were under scrutiny from the Attorney General because there were a lot of people who donated money to it. And they said, hey, we just, like the Champlin Foundation or the Rhode Island Foundation, we just donated all of this money, and now you want to sell these radio stations. It's public radio, NPR, you know. We, something doesn't smell right here. So the attorney general had to be involved with the sale of the radio station. So that's where things got slowed up. It was a two and a half year process. So in 2009, here I am in the ground building now because I had moved in, in June of uh, 2007, and I finally find out that the station's granted in April of 2009, and, and I had a green light. I could go up to 12.30. Well, there's just one problem. The Attorney General approved it, the FCC approved it, but what was I missing? <laughs> Therefore, I uh, you know, had to start from square one as far as financing went. We, we're now in a bad you know, recession, and the company that I thought I was getting financing from uh, just went away. They weren't there anymore, so I had to start going to local banks. So I went to the Westerly Community Credit Union, and these are all great people, so don't think I'm bad-mouthing anybody, because I'm not. But they did everything they could possibly do within their means. I mean, local financial institutions, they, they don't really know what to think of a radio station license, because what am I buying? It wasn't the equipment, it was a piece of paper. It's that license that makes a radio station what its value is. I mean, your, your tower and your hardware and all of that stuff, that's, that's equipment. It's, it's like a liquor license. It's the same thing. It's your license to use the airwaves. So it uh, didn't work out with the credit union a few other places. Instead, they just you know, lend to person at the time, just you know, personal loans and not business loans. But then finally, I uh, was able to make some headway over at the Washington Trust Company. So um, with the help of Phil Friend and Tom Quinlan and a few other people at Washington Trust, uh, they were able to make that loan happen. And in 
November of 2009, the closing finally went through. It was actually November 14th that I took over at 12.30 a.m. My friend Steve Conti helped me, and we pulled the plug down there in Margin Street. It was right in the middle of Fun Drive for NPR. They, and they were, they were on the air saying, okay, make sure you give money, and you know, <laughs> we're, we're looking for you know, 20,000, 30,000, what's the goal? And we pulled the plug out. <laughs> And then, for, and then we came on the air for that weekend, and we ran an announcement per uh, W, the call letters for WRNI in Providence, and they, were, they used this as like a relay station, they, for the call letters for WXNI. So we would go on the air every 10 minutes and say, <laughs> if you're looking for WRNI, we moved to 102.7 FM because they bought 102.7 in Narragansett Pier. So we were basically running an announcement saying for all of those listeners to go to 102.7, and then on the Monday of the following week, which would have been, let's see, the 14th was a Saturday. I remember all these dates. That's crazy. So then on, on uh, November 16th, 2009, WBLQ LP 96.7, we moved that programming over to 1230. I simulcasted for a week just to try to get all the listeners to realize we were now on 1230. But right then I had really no extra money, especially now that I just took out this loan with Washington Trust. My mortgage payments were 35, still are $3,500 a month. And you know, first month was like, oh, I can do this, I can do this. And, I, and then, then when I had the station, I was like, what the heck did I just do? <laughs> <laughs> and basically, I'm doing everything I did before, except now I've got this new $3,500 a month bill. <laughs> and so I was like, what do I do now? <laughs> um, so basically, I found another, something about my luck with finding uh, religious Christian broadcasters. They're all great people, but I found one in Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, a gentleman by the name of Stephen Binley uh, had a station up there, WYCM, a non-commercial Christian station. And I said, "Hey, you know, what would you think about, you know, rebroadcasting what you're doing down here in uh, the Ashaway Westerly area, 96.7?" So convinced him to lease 96.7. So that's where I got some of my startup seed money with 12:30. Well, after I think everything happens for a reason. About uh, eight months after having 1230, uh, his organization went into some financial difficulty, and Charlie's Mobile also left the location the very same day. And Charlie, the, ele the electricity was under his name. So when Charlie moved out, the electric got shut off, but the religious people couldn't pay their bill anyway, WYCM. So that's why I believe that there definitely is a God in heaven, because it all just happened all at the same time. So 96.7 went, went off the air for two months, and I just had 12.30. So as I'm running 12.30, I, I started to make headway, and luckily I've kept my friendship with John Fuller over the years, the guy that I first worked for, um, who's very, uh, has always been tight-knit with the car dealers, and I am just very persistent with going to see different you know, car dealerships, and I had gone up to this place, Central Auto Group in Plainfield, Connecticut, about 10 million times, then one day, John gives me a call, and it's the way he talks. Hey, Chris, you go, can you be here at 1030? And I said, and I just happened to be in Preston, Connecticut at the time, and that, there's fate again. And I was about 15 minutes away. I said, sure, I'll be there in 15 minutes. And I went over there, and I met the owner of Central Auto Group, um, and sat down with me and said, you know, what can I do? I want to be on your radio station twice an hour, every hour. That's the way I buy radio. Either I buy it that way, or I don't buy it at all. So. You'll never believe how much he started paying for his radio ads in February of 2010. $3,500 a month. <laughs> it's not on my, my mortgage. And to this day, wow. four years later, he's fluctuated. He's gone up to four, 35, four. Um, but, but he's been a rock since the beginning, uh, Central Auto Group. Then it's, it's evolved into me voicing all of their ads that run on all of the radio stations. So really, that was like my, my door that opened up there was with Central, and then, then when Central Auto Group started advertising, I started giving these other car dealers. Since then, we've had MJ Sullivan, uh, the Valenti family of dealerships. Actually, the guy that used to be the general manager at Central got fired, and now he's the advertising director over at Valenti. These guys move around, so it's like, you know, so, so if you ever listen to WBLQ, you might hear like five, six, seven car ads, you know, in a row, but that's pretty much the automobile industry uh, was what made it possible for me to you know, take that step. And, and another uh, person I met the acquaintance of uh, was some afternoon time, I lease on 12.30 a.m., and, and a woman out of Seattle, her name is Dr. Pat Vasily, and she has a network called the 